My name is Danny Tao, and I am one of the pre-pharmacy coordinators for this year's conference. Our panelists are representing a variety of institutions around the nation, and I would like to thank them for joining us today. I would also like to thank all of the attendees for coming to this year's first pre-pharmacy admissions panel. Without further ado, we will begin by having our panelists introduce their name, position, and institution. And we can begin with Dr. Heimer. So my name is Dr. Heimer. Um, I am here representing the College of Pharmacy at a place called Turo University, California. We're in the North Bay. Um, in addition to being the chair of the admissions committee, somebody who will be reviewing applications coming into our program, I'm also an assistant professor and I teach in biological sciences. And most of the work that I do or most of the lectures I deliver are related to infectious disease topics, getting you set up for the antibiotic lectures. My name is Joel Gonzalez. I'm the admissions director at UC San Francisco School of Pharmacy, located in San Francisco. And she's going to be a hard act to follow, I can already tell. So <laughs> we're in for a long hour. Good morning. My name is Kim Dunn, and I'm the regional director of student affairs and admissions for the College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences in Bowie's Creek, North Carolina. My name is Avon Humphreys, and I am the Director of Pharmacy Outreach for Union University School of Pharmacy. We are located in West Tennessee, between Memphis and Nashville, along I-40. Uh, my name is Jason McDowell. I am Outreach and Admissions Advisor for California North State University College of Pharmacy, and we're located all the way on the other side of 50 in Rancho Cordova, near Sacramento. Thank you. All right, our first question will be for everyone on the panel, and starting from Dr. Heimer, if you could sum up in one sentence what is unique about your school, what would it be? Uh, we put a lot of emphasis on uh, experience, and so our curriculum is designed as a two, two plus two program. So we have two years of clerkship that our students do in their third and fourth year. I think uh, one of the uh, aspects that makes UCSF unique is that we have, uh, our curriculum is designed around three different pathways that all lead to the PharmD degree, but allow a student with um, different interests, perhaps, than their classmates to um, pursue their degree under sort of a different pathway. It's kind of like a minor. Everyone's a PharmD major, but a minor is a little bit different based on your own particular needs. And then, um, finally, probably the setting of San Francisco makes our program a little bit different in terms of the sort of the vibrancy of the city. Um, at Campbell University, I think something that makes our program a little bit unique is that we offer several, several dual degrees in the Master of Clinical Research, Master in Pharmaceutical Sciences, Master in Public Health, and then an MBA. And we also offer several interprofessional opportunities because we have a School of Osteopathic Medicine, we have a Doctor of Physical Therapy program, a Physician Assistant program, and then all of those dual degrees that I just talked about. At Union University, we are on a small undergraduate campus, but we share um, other health sciences and social work and nursing. So we do a lot of collaboration with those departments in teaching our students how to work with different healthcare professions. We also offer a PGY-1 residency program within our school, as well as postdoc fellowship, because we do have our own in-house research with a research track for our students, even though we don't offer the PhD. At uh, California North State University College of Pharmacy, what sets us apart is team-based learning. We don't do traditional uh, education. We have a team-based learning um, system of, of, doing, of transmitting the knowledge to you, so it's a little bit different. Okay. For the next question, um, may we please start with Mr. McDowell. After reading hundreds of personal statements, what advice would you give to applicants about their writing other than correct grammar and having others revise their paper? Because this has happened recently, keep it unique, keep it your own, don't let it be your undergrad paper, make a new paper, write a new personal statement that is your own, unique, and something that actually drives you. I, I tell students this all the time, you don't wake up every morning thinking about your grandmother, and that's why you're going to go take that chemistry test. Talk about what motivates you, what motivates you in the science fields. Um, I would say if there is something in your experience that is driving your passion for pharmacy, include that in your, uh, in your uh, personal essay, um, whether it's uh, a personal experience with a family member, um, but m let us know why pharmacy. Um, and what is unique about you and what your talents bring to the table that will make you a great pharmacist. 
Um, I would recommend that you start a journal right now if you don't already have one and not just list the, I did this on this date and this on this date, but really reflect on your experiences that have made you into the person that you are today and the healthcare professional that you're going to be tomorrow so that when you go to write your personal statement, it's not so difficult because that is a really difficult part of the personal state, the application. Um, and I would echo what uh, my fellow panelists have said too. Um, those of you who are familiar with our application process know it's pretty um, challenging because so much of it includes writing essays. And, and that being said, um, I, I think what we're looking for, as uh, some of the panelists have said, is just a real sense of authenticity. Um, you know, I, I think all of our programs make our biggest cuts on the written application alone. And so in order to do that, you, you really want to get to know the applicants as much as possible on paper. Um, and so it really behooves you as an applicant to, to really sort of tell your story um, in, in giving us a chance to get to know you. And oftentimes, I think, especially from schools that have really um, strong pre-pharmacy organizations or pre-health uh, organizations or health career centers that uh, really prepare students, you often see packages, uh, applications that are so overly packaged that you never really get a sense of the applicant themselves because they've tried to sort of uh, you know, fit their essay into a particular mold that they've seen samples of or that they know students who are currently in um, professional programs, whether it be pharmacy or medicine or nursing, and try to sort of duplicate their essay because they felt that the other individual who's in the program was successful. And in doing that, sort of lose themselves. And it's really frustrating to open up an application and spend you know, several hours reading multiple essays and then close the file and never really get a sense of who that individual is because they didn't really tell their story. So you know, our, our review process is really about authenticity and honesty strengths and weaknesses combined just to get a sense of who that individual is. You know, I'm going to have to agree here. These are all very important points. One of the things I also would encourage you to think about is be visionary. There's a lot of changes coming down the pike. And we're, at Toro, we're really interested in, in grooming leadership in individuals and in encouraging them not to accept the status quo, but to see how they can use their degree to improve health outcomes and to improve the community around them, whether they be the patient community or whether they be the profession. Um, or their own immediate community. And so it's, think about, spend a little bit of time thinking about if you had this degree, how would you be using it in a way to um, identify, well, to identify something that you'd like to see improved and how you might be able to do that with your degree. Be visionary, also kind of show us your dreams and how you plan to use this career, this career change you're going to make. Thank you. Dr. Heimer, can you begin and tell us what's the most important factor that your school looks for when reviewing pharma school applications? Oh my goodness, that's very difficult. I don't think that there's really a single factor. It's kind of a formula. We're looking at a lot of different things simultaneously. Um, I have to say, though, when I'm looking at my faculty evaluations of our candidates, one of the things I put a heavy degree of emphasis on is communication skills. And I think this feeds back into what you just heard earlier this morning. This is, um, this is a profession that has a lot of interdisciplinary connections. And so it's really important that our applicants feel comfortable in speaking and communicating their thoughts with us as interviewers, but also with the idea that they'll be able to communicate with their colleagues in other professions and be able to communicate effectively with their patients. So I think communication is just a huge, a very important skill, a huge component of the interview. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. We probably deny more people based on poor communication skills than we do on lack of academic preparation for a rigorous uh, doctoral program. And that's very difficult to um, convince applicants and pre-pharmacy students because it's always easier for you to compare yourself in terms of a GPA with somebody else and see how you match up. And oftentimes, as many of you have probably been on some of those public forums online, you know, people list their uh, stats, and it's always GPA and how many hours of a particular community service event they've been a part of. Um, and for us, it's, it's really, it really comes down to communication skills. Uh, strong written communication skills on the application can trump so many other deficiencies in the candidacy, yet many other strengths in an application can't overcome poor writing skills. 
So, you know, when, and all of us, you know, are in the business of admissions and reading applications. Um, when you do come across an application that's just really thoughtful, really uh, introspective, and well written, it really is refreshing and really hard to deny moving that individual forward because at that point you, you're telling yourself, wow, I'd really like to get to know this person because, you know, the writing is so strong. They're able to demonstrate their intellectual maturity, their passion. Um, their understanding for the profession, and that all comes through just thoughtful and introspective writing. So communication skills are essential, and obviously when you get to the point of interview, you know, having those strong um, in-person skills and those oral communication skills are, you know, they can seal the deal. That's really difficult to follow, but yes, I would agree with all of that. Um, we do use a holistic process when we're reviewing the applications, um, but we're also looking specifically at leadership, professionalism, and your service experiences. Our campus is located in a very rural and underserved area, so your service experience is very important to us. We also look at service experience as well. Um, we do annual medical mission trips um, out of the country as well as we do our own um, community service there within our community of Jackson, Tennessee. We serve the underserved population there. Um, but communication skills, passion, professionalism, um, all of those are things that we look for, and we look at the entire um, application as well. Um, some things are obvious that you have to look at, like GPA and PCAT, but beyond that, we look at the entire person. I'm going to bring it back to communication skills. You can be the smartest person in this room, but if you can't tell me anything, I can't know that. So it's communication skills. Um, since we do team-based learning and you're working in groups and you'll be working in a group when you're a pharmacist, um, you need to be able to communicate your ideas from the simplest to the most complex. Thank you. We'll begin with Mr. McDowell for the next question. Is there a unique curriculum or degree program that your school offers? The team-based learning, completely different. It will blow your mind. The other thing that we've just started up is um, an MBA program with our PharmD. So in your second year, you can start working on getting your MBA and do a dual degree with us in Sac State. Um, I would say we do have a PharmD MBA dual track um, in our program as well. Uh, we focus a lot on community pharmacy, um, but with our uh, residency program, we're also looking to develop more uh, pharmacists in, that will practice in a hospital or clinical setting as well. Again, we have the dual degrees in pharmaceutical sciences, clinical research, public health, and MBA. Um, in addition to that, we also have six residency programs. Uh, at UCSF, we have a joint PharmD PhD program. You don't apply to them together or you don't work on them simultaneously, but once you're done with the PharmD program and enter the PhD program, because some of the coursework that you have based on our pathways in our PharmD program will allow you to shorten the length of a PhD program. So some of the foundational work in a PhD program can actually be done as part of the PharmD program if you're part of that particular pathway um, in getting your PharmD degree. So. Uh, Turo, the uh, College of Pharmacy op also offers dual degree programs that are sort of research intensive or associated with a College of Public Health. Um, I think our curriculum in and of itself is rather innovative. As I mentioned earlier, we have what we call the two plus two system. So your third and fourth year, you will not be in a classroom. You will actually be out in the field, in the pharmacy, working with the pharmacist and seeing the patients. You'll have 14 six-week rotations that you will do, half of which you're required to do in community setting, hospital pharmacies, acute care, um, ambulatory care, and then the rest is up, for, up to you. You know, you pick the kinds of rotations that fit your interests in a particular population of patients or a particular type of setting, and so you can be doing anything from pediatrics to diabetes clinics to infectious diseases, you know. It's really all up to you to, to kind of hone in on the type of education that you're interested in. Thank you. Starting from Dr. Heimer, what are some things in your opinion that makes an applicant stand out? Oh, that's a good question. Um, one of the things that I think this kind of taps on some things that we maybe had said earlier. Um, individuals in my mind that stand out, you know, of course having some unique experiences, but the, sometimes those are beyond our control. But people who take the initiative to get involved and take on leadership roles say a lot to me. Um, it says that uh, they're willing to take on responsibility. Um, they've practiced some communication skills. They have organizational skills. They can juggle a couple of different things going on at the same time, because usually you're just not, you know, leading something. You're probably going to 
classes or you're working a job or something like that. Um, and it, it shows a commitment and a passion to something. And I think getting involved, and if you're in involved in some type of, of club or some type of organization, but being willing to step up and take on a leadership role, I think that says a, an awful lot about a candidate. Yeah, uh, you know, I think oftentimes what what stands out on an application is when you when you have a, a balance um, in an application, in the materials, of someone who's able to demonstrate their, their understanding of this particular profession. Um, you know, nobody wants to admit a student um, sort of on blind faith thinking that they've made the right decision to pursue pharmacy. And so, you know, at, at, at the heart of an application, there needs to be just a solid understanding of why they're pursuing this, this profession. And, and for us, it doesn't come in the form of having certain number of hours in a pharmacy setting or certain types of experience, but it's, a, it's the ability for us to read an application and feel confident that you've made the right decision. Nobody wants to admit a student who um, is in the program for a couple weeks or a couple months and then decides, you know, I, I really don't think that this is for me. I think I, I made a mistake and want to go into a different sort of area of healthcare. And so just that solid fundamental um, understanding and the ability to articulate why this particular profession is the right one for you. That being said, there's also a huge value that we place on what else besides pharmacy makes up who you are. And so it's, it's kind of frustrating to open up an application and to read essay after essay after essay that really is all pharmacy related. It's kind of sort of um, what we refer to as a sort of a one trick pony. That, that there just is nothing else, you know? And sometimes you'll get sort of essays like that with various topics, that every single essay is revolved around one particular activity that they were involved in or one particular um, work experience that they've had. And so, so for us, just trying to find sort of a diverse array of experiences that the student was passionate about that is not necessarily pharmacy related for us to get a sense of who you are. You know, pharmacy doesn't define any of us completely. And so we're trying to get a sense of who you are as an individual. So what other activities are you involved in? What, what other passions do you have that make you a complete person, whether it's cooking or sports or civic engagement or religious experiences, whatever that sort of makes you who you are, those are the types of things we want to see on an application, um, in addition, obviously, to your uh, ability to articulate why you're pursuing this particular profession. I would agree with my fellow panelists and just kind of take it back to the personal statement. And again, if you can help me to visualize the experiences that you've had that have developed you into the person and the healthcare provider that you're going to become, that's very helpful. Um, in addition to that, you should really uh, make sure that you prepare your letters of rec the people who are going to write your letters of recommendation because they can really add an extra level. So if I'm looking at an application and I'm saying, okay, this person, okay, they've, they've done this, they've done that, you know, it looks pretty similar to everyone else's application. And then I read their personal statement and I think, wow, this person is amazing. I must meet them. And then I see your letters of reference and they also think you're amazing. Uh, that really adds something to the top of it and you'll be coming in for an interview. I, I would agree with that. Um, also, but make sure that you know what your references are going to say about you. Mm -hmm. um, we've received some letters of reference that I'm sure the applicant probably wished had not been submitted. Um, so know who that person is that's writing that letter of re recommendation. Make sure you're on the same page and that they can be honest and truthful about your experience as well. But a balanced application overall with um, leadership, service, um, workload that you've taken um, each semester. You know, how many hours have you taken? Each, can you handle the, the, uh, the intensity of a PharmD program? Yes. <laughs> but uniqueness in general, uh, may, let be, stand out. There's, we see so many applications. If you can be, oh, that's the one that, or that's this one, uh, that's the best thing because then your name is brandied about with a positive attribute, that, that's the best way you can be, you can stand out. Thank you. Starting from Mr. McDowell, with more pharmacists applying for residency programs, how does your school prepare students to be more competitive in the workforce? Why do I get the tough one first? <laughs> well, we have a residency program at our school, so that's awesome, and there's, so a lot of students are able to learn from that. The other would be just um, getting ready to work in teams. The team-based learning is huge, and be being already aware of uh, the way our team-based learning, uh, team learning 
um, works is that every semester you're gonna get a brand new group with brand new people. You don't get to take your best friends with you. So um, getting ready to do that, uh, when, when I left my last job, I couldn't take my best friends. They were awesome, but uh, being ready to transition and, and make that move without without complaint, hopefully. Um, that's, that's probably the biggest thing that we do to get you ready for just a transition, just a, something new. Um, we actually start our experiential uh, component of our program after your first semester. So we're getting you out there after one semester, meeting with preceptors, making those relationships, um, building that network that you're going to have. Um, and then the rest of your experiential takes place halfway through your third year and all of your fourth year. Uh, we also do residency and career fairs every fall for our students. Um, and we do have our own residency PGY2. We have two slots in our residency program. Um, I think also the research component of our program has helped a lot of our students who have gone on to residencies be successful because they have had that experience in our research area. I think the dual degrees also help to differentiate people. You need to be able to differentiate yourself because the residency process is so competitive. So in any of the experiences that you have, in addition to those, we start our residency preparedness workshops during your P1 year and continue those each year. Plus we have the residencies through the school. So you have those resources as well. Yeah, we do have a residency program at UCSF. There are anywhere between 12 and 14 residents. So there is a culture in our program of uh, you know, being surrounded by residents and, and having that experience. Um, annually, anywhere between 60 and 70% of our students who graduate go into a residency. So, so the culture exists. And so we, what we try to do is just um, continue to support that during the first year and, and making sure students are aware of the possible track. But we're also... Um, Quick, and I appreciate the question about residency, but we're also quick to um, you know, let students know that the residency is not necessarily for everyone. There are other career opportunities out there that don't require a residency. Because I think sometimes, especially in our program, there is such a huge emphasis placed on the need to pursue a residency. And I think for some people, that may not be part of their plan. And so we certainly don't want to exclude those individuals from feeling a sense of success once they complete the program and decide to pursue another line of training. So we try to find a balance and, and make sure that students are aware of the opportunities and try to support uh, you know, whatever path that they think they might want to pursue post PharmD program. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I, you know, at Toro, I think we have a lot of the same kind of uh, things insti insti instituted in, in introducing our students into the concepts of residencies, having them, given them opportunities to meet with residency programs um, throughout the country. We also have our own, we have seven residency programs associated with Toro, and we have residents on campus as well are part of our program, so they do have as was mentioned here, a culture around them that they can tap into and explore. Um, I, I, let's see, I think our last graduating class, 25% of the class actually went on to do residencies. So there's a strong interest among our students to pursue that type of uh, avenue for professional development, and they've been quite successful at it. And I think a lot of that has to do with the amount of experience and the sense of con competence and confidence that they have in their skills from the time that they've actually spent out in the pharmacy. Um, in addition, we do spend a fair amount of time developing programs for interdisciplinary education that open up no new doors to them, um, as well as placing them in a number of different sites, which also have residency programs that get them introductions to the program and, and individuals that would be, they'd be participating in work with um, that also help open up some doors. Thank you, Dr. Heimer. And can you begin by um, giving us a suggestion. Many schools require a basic letter of recommendation from a pharmacist and a science professor. Who do you recommend applicants get the remaining letter of recommendation from? Mm -hmm. You kind of named like two professions there, really, a pharmacist and an educator. I'm, I'm not sure that I could name like another type of profession that I would seek that uh, letter from, but what I would recommend highly is that you look for people who have seen you work um, have seen you progress in something that you've put your heart to so that they can write with a genuine and sincerity about your passion for things, about your committedness, um, your work ethic, your ability to work in teams, your communication skills, somebody you really do have a good relationship with. I'd also recommend it be somebody who has the ability to make decisions about building teams or including people into a group. So that this letter says, you know what, I'd pick this person again to work with if I had the choice. 
We're extremely liberal with our uh, letter writer requirements. We don't, um, we won't accept a letter from a friend or a family member. Otherwise, we don't have any requirements. Um, it would be nice to see a letter from a, a, a professor or or someone who could speak to your academic background or your academic abilities only, you know, only because it's an academic program. But it's not a requirement, and it's not something that we check off on a review form. Um, that being said, we would actually prefer a letter from a professor that really knew you versus a professor from your biology class that perhaps won a Nobel Prize, um, but that doesn't really know you. Uh, you know, because because really, as Kim said, the the letters really are an extension of your application. Uh, you are limited with your essay responses by word counts. The letter writers uh, don't have those limitations, and they certainly could expand upon um, different areas of your candidacy. I always encourage students, if you believe there are deficiencies that you really don't have a chance to address in your application, if you know someone who's writing a letter, you certainly can have the ability to, to be a little bit strategic and have them address some of those deficiencies that you may not have been able to do yourself in the application. But, that, but you can only do that if you know the letter writers well enough, which sort of leads me into know who's writing your letter and know that they're writing a letter that supports your candidacy. Um, and it is frustrating to, to see a, a well-prepared application. Um, the, indi the individual, for all intents and purposes, is competitive for a program. And then you get to the letters, and the individual just didn't take advantage of the opportunity to, to gather people that really could support and advocate and advance their candidacy. So it really is about people who really know you well. And that's that's what we look at. We would, we would much rather see a professor from the women's studies department where you were a minor who you took two classes from write an in-depth letter that really talked about your ability to work with your colleagues, your passion for education, um, those types of things, than a professor that didn't know you well, that only could tell you what the grade was you received in the class and only could talk about the content of the curriculum in that particular course. It doesn't tell us anything about you and it really wastes an opportunity for you to extend your application uh, in getting your information into our hands? Um, we do require the pharmacy letter and a science professor letter. And beyond that, we'll accept one or two additional letters. We require three. Um, the third and fourth can come from anyone that knows you well, can speak to your passions. Um, the other thing that I would add to that is that you want to make sure your letter recommenders know that you're applying to multiple schools because sometimes we'll get a letter that says, oh, this person is going to make a great student at XYZ school and it's not Campbell University. <laughs> so um, you want to make sure they know you're applying to other schools um, and just that they really know who you are and can speak to your passions. Uh, along those same lines, um, if you are torn between dentistry, medicine, and pharmacy, make sure the letter mentions pharmacy and not one of the other health professions. We've received letters um, that said this person will make a fantastic dentist. And I'm like, well, that's great. Let me know when they get out and maybe I'll go see them. Um, but if you, if you have somebody that you've done a, a lot of either leadership work with or community service work with, a nonprofit, and you're close with that executive director and they know your heart for service, that would be a great letter of recommendation that could speak to your character and your commitment to, to serving others around you. Because pharmacy is a ministry, it's a service uh, to others who are hurting. Um, and so we want to see your heart as well. We require the same to the pharmacist uh, or healthcare provider and a um, faculty. If uh, I would suggest if you have a faculty that you've done research with because you will have worked with them more one on one than you ha will with a faculty that may be in a classroom like this uh, where you're one of, I don't know, what's the number in this room? 300? Um, that, 400, excellent. Um, something that is going to be more personal, uh, the better. Um, we will look at your other letters of recommendation. We require two, uh, but more than likely our admissions committee won't review the other two. They'll just look at the two. Thank you. Really quick, too. Um, more and more, as the years have progressed, we've been um, following up with letter writers as well. Obviously not all of them, but when we do have a candidate that um, we do have questions about or something comes up perhaps in the letter of recommendation that may not um, be consistent with what we're seeing in the, the candidate's application, we, um, we have actually followed up with letter writers to get a, a sense of the information that they provided and a little bit more information on an applicant. 
Um, and so just be aware of that, that they do provide their contact information. And you know, as most letter writers will say, please contact me if you have more information. And, and we have been doing that. Obviously not with everyone or you know, all three or four letters that are submitted per application, but, um, but, but it's important. I mean, if we're really trying to vet candidates to see who is the right fit for our program, we are going to call letter writers just to, to get some additional information if we need that to make a decision. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Starting from Mr. McDowell, does your, pharm does your pharmacy school have community outreach programs or opportunities that pharmacy students can take part in? If so, can you please give us an example? Yes, too many. <laughs> <laughs> we have three fraternity, well, three social, frater uh, sorry, professional fraternities and uh, so many clubs, it's alphabet soup when I walk upstairs and look at the doors, uh, doing everything from women's health to cancer to everything. Um, so challenging to get three students in a room together at some point because they're going to three different clubs. Um, so a lot of opportunities. Um, so if there is something that you uh, have a passion for now, more than likely there is a club that will take that passion and, and move it forward. So too many. Um, yeah, at the Union we do, I mentioned earlier, the International Medical Mission trip every January during our J term. We do a lot of flu immunization clinics around Jackson with our underserved population and our senior citizen population. Um, there is an organization that can fit your passion at our school. We have two fraternities and the rest are, are social organizations. Um, that you know, if you have an interest in hospital pharmacy, we can help you plug in. If you have an, an interest in community pharmacy, we can help you plug in there as well. We do a lot of health screenings around town. We have a double A ball team in Jackson. So we set up there and we do a lot of um, health fair and health expo type things as well. We work with uh, uh, nonprofits in the area, uh, food drives for the food pantry. Um, domestic violence awareness um, for our women and men's rape assistance program in Jackson. So a lot of different ways that our students plug in community-wise. Um, toys, toy drives in the, in the, uh, at Christmas time for families who can't afford to buy toys for their children, those kinds of things. Same here, there's uh, more organizations than I could, could ever remember. <laughs> um, we also do medical missions. Um, we have a missions elective and we have two students at the uh, Indian Health Services in Alaska right now. We usually take trips over winter break and over summer break. Many of those are interprofessional trips. Um, we do tons of health fairs, health clinics, uh, lots of outreach to the community. Yeah, we have to put a limit on involvement it, because there are just so many opportunities. And, and obviously, students who are you know, in professional programs are really um, driven and really want to get involved and obviously in the health professions really want to help and so you know sometimes that has to be sort of limited in order for them to focus on the curriculum at certain points but um, you know one of the the beauties of our program is that a lot of uh, the extracurricular activities are, are partnerships with uh, medical nursing dentistry um, and perhaps PhD students so that's a lot of how the interprofessionalism um, comes into play in our program. You, the speaker this morning talked about that, and so um, you know that's a, it's certainly in something that many of our students take advantage of in terms of networking with other health professionals. So, my goodness, I think the answer is ditto. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that we have created at Toro that they're they're very proud of is we have opened up our own student-run free clinic in the city of Vallejo um, to provide services to underserved populations, and this is an interdisciplinary project that has been put forth and it's been very successful. But in addition to that, students get involved in a lot of other pre-existing community outreach programs. They create those of their own. They spend a lot of time doing the health fairs um, and creating other opportunities within their clubs and within some of the uh, local chapters of the professional organizations to reach out to the community. Lots of fun. Thank you, Dr. Heimer. In a few sentences, can you tell us how important diversity is to your school? Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think you're going to hear the answer probably from all of these programs that we want to encourage everybody to pursue their dreams and to reach out into the community and care. Um, it is very important to us. Um, 
our average student um, is about 26 years old, so we do have a spectrum of ages in our classroom. A vast majority of our students are bilingual, so um, you'll see a lot of diversity among your classmates. Um, we have uh, students that are part of our program that have come from countries abroad, so to come to the United States and study and study with our program. So there's a, a substantial amount of diversity, and we're really pleased with it, and I think our students are very happy. Um, with the kind of diversity they have in their classmates. It's very inspiring for them. Yeah, I, I would echo, I, I mean, I think anyone who works in admissions is really looking for, you know, working to um, coordinate a very diverse group of students to enter the program. I mean, you know, there's so much that can be taught through a curriculum and the rest is gonna be taught through classmates and sort of interactions with each other and learning from each other's experience. And so, you know, looking for students who come from different backgrounds, who come from, you know, different parts of the country and the world uh, to form a cohort of students that's going to potentially change the world of this profession. So, um, you, you know, in addition to that, we're also looking for diversity of aspiration. You know, there are so many parts of the country and the world that need healthcare professionals. And so, you know, knowing what people's desires are and future goals are as it relates to this profession is, is part of what we look for. Um, we also ask, one of our essay questions is focused around what has been your, what has been your commitment in the past to serving um, other communities or underserved populations. This doesn't start in pharmacy school. And anybody who has a strong track record is always going to beat somebody with a good future plan. Because having your experiences in the past is going to more often predict your experiences in the future rather than you having a great game plan to start all this service when you get into pharmacy school. It just doesn't, it doesn't pan out like that, especially when you're competing with you know, hundreds if not thousands of applicants who, who have a long-term commitment to serving other people. Being, uh, being housed in San Francisco, obviously it's an incredibly diverse city, and so you know, being able to be comfortable working in different communities is going to be able to set you apart from many other applicants. We can't achieve diversity in healthcare without diversity in the classroom, so I think we're all striving for as much diversity in every area in the classroom. Uh, that's gonna help the learning environment for the students and, and going to help the healthcare professionals you know, as they go out into the world. Uh, we do have a diversity board. We have a health professions readiness and enrichment program that's a week-long summer program for uh, financially disadvantaged and underrepresented students. Um, so we do as much as we can to increase the diversity of the class at Campbell. Um, even in West Tennessee, we have some diversity <laughs> and, uh, at Union yeah. University. It is a small, small private faith-based university with a student class size of 60 students. But within those 60 students, we do still see quite a bit of diversity. Um, uh, you know, gender, race, religion. Um, we have students that are Muslim, Catholic, Jewish, Christian, agnostic, atheistic. So we see everything um, in our student body. And it really, to me, I, I think it gives our students that have not been exposed to as much. Um, I love to see them talking with a student that comes from a war-torn country. And what is healthcare like in your country? What are the social customs and the social mores that dictate how healthcare is delivered in your country? And our students can share those experiences with each other. So I think diversity, I think it's important to all of us, obviously. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and not to limit diversity to just, just those things, but also diversity in your, uh, in your majors, diversity in what you, what you do personally. Um, I, I really want a student that's 6'10 or above, so if you know any really tall pharmacists that can see well <laughs> above the counter, I'm looking for that. Also would like a smaller pharmacist if possible. Everything, uh, shoe size, hair color, uh, length of hair, anything that's different is, is nice um, to see. We, we see 100 students start school. It's nice to look at 100 uh, different unique students. Thank you. Mr. McDowell. Do you have any advice for students who do not get into pharmacy school? Um, try again. <laughs> Just because you weren't accepted one year doesn't mean you won't be accepted the year after. Um, what my biggest suggestion is, uh, this is gonna sound awful in English, but don't not do anything. Uh, do something different. Obviously there was something that got you to an interview do something different. Practice your interview skills, write better essays, revise your essays, um, take classes, 
get some more experience. Uh, the worst thing I can see is an applicant coming two years in a row and I look at it and I go, okay, so the difference is you're one year older. Um, you know, do something different um, that will that'll either make you stand out or make you a better candidate. Um, I would say be open to honest and critical feedback. Um, talk if possible, get some feedback from the admissions uh, director or whoever lets you know that you did not get in. So what was it that was lacking in my application? Be open to hearing criticism, constructive criticism about what you can do to better yourself for the next year. If pharmacy is truly your passion, um, I believe that you, you have it within you to make the change to have, to have it happen down the road. But um, I would say be honest with yourself. Uh, maybe even talk to some professors. Uh, you know, to Give me a critique of me, of my communication skills, of my interview skills. Um, just be open to the fact that maybe you need to change something just a little bit. Not who you are, but maybe there's something that more that you can do. Um, pursue a master's degree, uh, diversify your healthcare experience, add more experiences to those. Uh, call us, uh, we'll talk to you about why you weren't interviewed or why you weren't accepted after the interview and go through your application. If you're close enough that you can come into the school, we'll sit down with you and go through the application with you. Um, if not, you can call us and we'll go through the application and talk to you about what you can do to be a more competitive applicant the next year. Um, I've always uh, offered reapplicant advising to in individuals who get denied from our program. Um, it's not a it's not a one way conversation. Before I have those meetings, I ask that you do some self reflection, and you know fill out some uh, a form that asks you different questions about your own candidacy and, and weaknesses and deficiencies that could be improved. Um, and so I spend uh, quite a bit of time in the spring having those conversations with students. We also have a post baccalaureate program that's focused specifically on pharmacy. So individuals who didn't get into a pre pharmacy pro or into a pharmacy program have the opportunity to um, be a part of our post-baccalaureate program. Um, it's very academic focused and so primarily what it is is to sort of beef up your academic preparation for a PharmD program. But we also require you to be a part of a seminar that does a little bit more of sort of application preparation, so interviewing skills, essay writing. Um, and again, working uh, collaboratively with um, post-baccalaureate medical students, post-baccalaureate uh, pre-dental students. So you sort of have a cohort of support. Um, and then I would encourage you not to give up. Uh, this past year, the entering class, 19% uh, of the students in our entering class were individuals who previously applied to a pharmacy program and didn't get admitted. Um, I, I'm working with a student now who's applying to our program for the fourth time um, and gets better every year. You know, my great hope is that he will um, be a stronger candidate now than he was before, and so that's only going to help him. But um, you know, if this is really your profession, it's about um, not giving up and sort of casting your net as wide as possible. Um, there are many pharmacy programs uh, in here, and if your goal is to become a pharmacist, um, look for any program that you feel that you can be successful at and cast your net as wide as possible so that you uh, can end up with uh, an offer of admission to a program that you believe you can be successful at. Yeah, I, I have to agree here. The idea is, is that People mature uh, academically and professionally at different rates. It's just, you know, just that the way it is. It's what makes us special. It's part of what makes us unique. Um, and so maybe when you're applying, you're just not quite there yet. But that doesn't mean to give up on the dream. You just continue to follow your passions. And, and that may involve doing some of the things that were just discussed here. Spending a little time reflecting on areas where you think maybe you have opportunities to mature more and find ways to do that. Um, follow your passions. If there are opportunities that are available to you that will allow you to develop professionally, go after them. And come back next year and you bring that experience with you to your application. I mean, we'll notice it. I agree. The one thing you don't want to do is not anything, not the same. You definitely want to continue to find ways to mature, find ways to grow. All right, this will be our last question and then we'll open the panel up to questions from the attendees. Okay, does, does your school have financial aid or scholarships and does the admissions process for a foreign student differ in any way? Yeah, Dr. Hammer. Okay. So yeah, we have, when you come in for your interview, you will meet with our financial aid office. Of course, we help you find federal funds. We have work study programs. There's lots of scholarships they track as well. I'm sure our students get almost a little bit tired of the 
emails I get inundated with from our faculty relaying all kinds of paid internship opportunities, fellowship applications. So, you know, people are very aware of your concerns about meeting tuition costs and finding ways to help you do that because their mission is to help you achieve your goal. Um, as far as our foreign students go, we do require that if you're submitting an application from a foreign institute uh, with uh, your, uh, your curriculum based in a foreign institution, that you have that uh, transcript translated by a particular agency that will help be able to us help us understand how that particular program credits align with a traditional uh, US program either in community colleges or four-year colleges and we also ask that our students in applying have one year of residency in the state of California and are in the process of acquiring their US uh, residency uh, yeah, we require all students who are uh, advanced to the interview process of our um, cycle to go through a financial aid workshop. Just to begin thinking about that, even though you haven't been admitted uh, into the program, just to begin thinking about uh, funding the program. And obviously, um, we have a strong financial aid program uh, at our school. Um, in terms of international students, um, we don't have any uh, additional requirements, or we're not uh, reviewing those any different than we would a, a non-international student, um, except for we also do require um, an evaluation of their non-US coursework if they did take college-level coursework outside of the United States. Um, otherwise, it's the same process. The only um, additional requirement we have for a non-US uh, citizen or as someone who's taken non-US coursework um, is that we require two English composition courses be completed in the United States. Um, that can certainly be done after they're admitted into the program, but before they start the program, uh, which is kind of a tight window, but we would do require two English composition courses be completed in the United States. Um, yes, we do have financial aid. <clears throat> North Carolina has a forgivable loan service. Um, we also gave out, uh, awarded over a million dollars in scholarships last year, and that number will just continue to grow. Um, and as far as international applicants, you're required to do your prerequisite coursework in, a uni in the United States. Um, we do have financial aid. Our admissions coordinator actually came to us from Union's financial aid department, so she is a guru at helping you find loan money, but also helping you identify scholarships that are out there, and we do have scholarships available. We also have employers calling us asking for interns out of our student body, so we can we share those job opportunities with our students who possibly want to work while they are in school. International students, um, we do have, I think there's a separate link on our website that's a two-page maybe application for international students. It's in addition to uh, what you do through FarmCAS. We have financial aid programs as well. Our biggest push um, starting this year is, is just financial education, just getting you aware of, of what, what is expected of you uh, financially for uh, student loans and everything like that. Scholarship opportunities during your second and third, year, uh, second, third and fourth year, most definitely uh, international students. Um, you do have to have residency here, and then we require a handful of your prereqs to be taken here. My biggest suggestion is to try to do, if you can, while you're taking those other courses, take some science courses as well, just so you're, you're ready for it. Thank you. So we'll begin taking questions from the attendees. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. This question is for Dr. Heimer and Dr. Knowledge for your respective schools. Yeah. Um, let's say if someone is, they graduated like 10 years ago. Yes. They're going back to school and obviously like some of them are four or three ranks and not current. Right. They take them at a community college. Right. Yep. Okay, okay, let me see if I can, I can, the, your first question here was regarding, um, oh my, call, okay, so, you know, we appreciate the fact that college credits are expensive, and a lot of our applicants do get coursework or complete coursework in community college. We get that, we understand that, and we don't, 
we don't necessarily discriminate between the kinds of uh, material that you're covering in a community college course versus a four-year college. We do look for consistency, so if you're moving around from different schools and maybe the classroom sizes are getting smaller or bigger, um, that there's not a huge fluctuation in the types of grades you're getting there, but what we see reported to us and what we base our, uh, our assessment on in terms of your academic performance is a cumulative GPA, okay? The, your first question had to do with sort of how recent the coursework was. Um, at Turo, we have no sort of guidelines or limitations on when those courses were taken. So, you know, if you have graduated and you're out there um, practicing your profession and you're deciding, oh, you know, I think I might want to come back and, and I think pharmacy is the right thing for me. I think I got it now. And so you come back and you take a few prereqs, but you're also drawing from other classes that you had taken, you know, six, seven years ago. That's not really a problem to us. Um, you know, there's no limitations. Um, it, uh, it is helpful to know that if you have been out of school for a while, that maybe you've taken a, a refresher course so we know that you know how to sit still in a chair, because we do have some students that come back after a considerable amount of time of being in the workforce, but it's generally not a problem. Next. Yeah, we don't have an expiration date on prerequisite requirements. So, um, you know, oftentimes individuals who have coursework from years ago, it just requires us to go back into those older catalogs of that particular school to make sure that those courses um, are preparing them for our, our curriculum. But otherwise, we don't have an a, um, a expiration date on any coursework. Um, you know, it's really, really rare to see an application where an individual's coursework was completed at one institution. I, it just, it, the landscape of higher education doesn't, uh, it, it just doesn't exist in a way that a student can really take all their coursework. When you do see that, it's usually from a private college or, or a small, a really small university where an individual has the ability to take courses across the curriculum that meet all of our requirements and get into those classes, especially if they're not of those majors. So it's very, very common for us to get uh, students uh, admitted and in the applicant pool who have taken prerequisite courses uh, at a community college. You know, oftentimes individuals don't even sort of realize that pharmacy is an option for them until they're sort of at the end of their undergraduate career. And so they don't have a choice but to go to a community college to pick up some of those prerequisites because they can't get into those classes at university. That's very common for us. Um, the FarmCast application provides us with a lot of data in terms of your academic background. It's not just one number. We're able to see how you, how you did by school. We're able to see how, you, how you've done by subject area in science, non-science, math. We're able to see trends. Obviously, an upward trend is better than a downward trend. Um, so we're looking at all that. In addition, no individual um, has the same academic path or academic background. So with the exception of twins that we reviewed a couple years ago that had everything exactly the same, um, everybody has a different path that they've taken. And so you know, it's really looking at that individual's path and saying, are they prepared now for a doctoral level program? Um, so. Um, if I could add something, we don't necessarily discriminate community versus a four year university, but we have seen um, some applicants that maybe weren't successful at the four year university and her, have heard that that course might be easier at a community college. Maybe they got um, a D at the university and they got an A at the community college. It's going to make us wonder. How is that being taught at that community college? Um, community colleges are great. They are a great resource for students. And, and as we mentioned earlier, credit hours are expensive. But we do want to see, um, we have been, we have seen a trend with some of our students coming from a particular community college. That they've been struggling more. Um, so we actually, we do look at where you did your work. Um, and if you tried at your four year, weren't successful, and try, we're gonna ask those questions. Um, did you take the hardest professor that you could? Those kinds of things. So, I mean, we do look at that, um, but we don't necessarily discriminate on that, but we do look at that, those differences. Yeah, and on the flip side, somebody who, uh, who, who only attended a community college um, for, for whatever reasons, perhaps they couldn't afford to attend a university or, you know, I mean, everybody has different circumstances, but it, it could very well be that the individual who completed all their prerequisites at a community college who never had the chance to go to a university um, is more competitive than the individual that graduated from Harvard and was just a very average student who had very below average communication skills. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's again, so it's, much that it's goes looking at it. every application yeah. and saying, is this, is this the right fit? 
I would just say don't look for the easy. I mean, just be thoughtful. Yeah. It's, it's your life that you're dealing with, your future, so. Sorry, can you repeat that, please? Uh, what would you say to an individual who struggles with being honest and then trying to be enough to be even as admitted to your honest So I, I, I want to see if I can clarify the question. So are you, are you um, asking about? Uh, Okay, they're coaching themselves for a particular type of program. They're creating a script for a particular type of program. Um, I, th I suppose that's a natural tendency for most people. They want to try and meet the expectations of a program. Um, and uh, I'm not sure that I've ever been in an interview situation where I've felt that it was was really too over the top. I think I think most people are generally pretty genuine. One of the things that does happen in our interview process at Toro is we do group interviews. So much like this, there's a group of about five of you sitting side by side, and we're asking questions, sometimes pointed to a particular individual, oftentimes general questions that are coming out. And I find that the group dynamics helps make people a little bit more genuine. They tend to, at first they're a little bit nervous, but then there's a tendency to relax, and I think we oftentimes we're getting to see the real candidate. Um, we do student interviews as well as faculty interviews, and we have found that um, we can sometimes get a better feel for who the student is. Sometimes we get a different perspective from our student interviewers that are interviewing our candidates, and so um, it is interesting to see that, uh, that different side of a person. I, I would suggest that you really look at the schools that you're applying to because you should be interviewing us as much as we're interviewing you. This is going to be the hardest four years of your life probably. So you want to make sure that it's a good fit and so you wouldn't necessarily be adjusting yourself to that school's mission. You would really be trying to find the school that fits best for you. Would anyone else like to add to that? Well, because we're looking for unique students just be yourself. There's no reason to try to fit a script or try to talk to what you think we want to hear. We want to hear about you because we're looking for, like I said, I'm looking for a hundred different people. If I wanted a hundred of the same people, I would, I would go to a student factory and just say, I need this GPA, I need these prereqs done, and this height, and, and go for it. It's, it's really about being unique, so don't worry about what you're going to say, worry about how you're saying it, and that you're saying it the way that you feel is correct. Up there? Yeah. Yeah, um, this is, is it for specifically for residency programs? I, I don't I'm not sure I of mean, the question. Are you asking how a person applies for a residency? <coughs> okay, there is a, I, ca I cannot think of the site right now, but there is SHP, ASHP has, uh, a, it's that American Society of Hospital Pharmacy, and um, they, there is, a, it's kind of like a, uh, clearinghouse of residency programs and you put in your preferences and um, hopefully you've done your interviews and then there's what's called match day um, and that's where you find out if you match somewhere so it's not done at each individual school necessarily the interviews or the or the hospitals um, it may have your interviews will take place there but it's all done through this one website at ASHP and I think for most residency programs they uh, the second part of your question um, they take students who've done their PharmD degrees from other institutions so it's not the case that everybody in a residency program at one institution were PharmD graduates from that institution. Right. It's, it's very common to, to have a, a mix of uh, residents in a particular program from all different pharmacy schools. Mm -hmm. Into the pharmacy program? 
transferring from one pharmacy program into another pharmacy program. Okay. Uh, in our particular school, that's actually sort of a tough transition because, our, because what we've done is we've taken what I think many programs accomplished didactically in three years. We've sort of uh, streamlined it in a way that we can accomplish it in two. And so we've not had any, I'll be honest, our, our program is still pretty young. It's, we've we've uh, been on it for about 10 years. We haven't had any transfer students. Um, but I have to admit that our faculty are Generally, they're pretty flexible and, and interested in finding ways to help people meet their goals. So I'm not saying that it's impossible, but it would be a challenge to find a way to fit the student into the program and, and ensure that they're not repeating too much material and that they haven't missed something. Yeah, um, we have actually had one transfer student, um, and there was some juggling and some flexibility on the part of the faculty in helping that work for that student. But she was a much better fit for our program, and she was going to be successful in our program, which she would not have been successful in the other. And we recognized that in her, so we were willing to, to make those adjustments for her. It's not easy to transfer, but it can be done. We, um, we have accepted students who've completed coursework uh, at another pharmacy school, um, but they have to start at the first year level of our program. So I, I get a lot of inquiries about that, but once they realize that they have to sort of start at the beginning, um, their applications don't come to fruition. So um, yeah, again, it's very much like how a program is built. Um, we require everyone to go through the complete program. We also require everyone to go through the complete program. So if you transferred, you'd be starting over with your P1 year. Um, we do have a post-baccalaureate program, but that's for students who did their BS in pharmacy and there aren't that many people left in that <laughs> arena. And Oh, okay. Uh, so we have a PharmD with a master's in clinical research, a master's in pharmaceutical sciences, a master's in public health, or an MBA. Uh, in each of those, they differ a little. The MBA, you can still complete that in four years. Uh, the clinical research, the pharmaceutical sciences, and the public health have some classes. They all have some classes that transfer in uh, to the pharmacy program back and forth, so you only add one additional year for those programs. Um, if you have your bachelor's degree coming in, once you complete your uh, master's, you're awarded that master's at that time. If you do not have your bachelor's degree, then you're awarded the master's degree when you complete the doctor of pharmacy. Uh, did you have anything specific that you were interested in about? We ask for it on our supplemental, so I think that's going to kind of vary from school to school. As I mentioned, we have a PharmD PhD program. I'll be at the, the fair outside this afternoon, so if anybody has any questions about that particular program, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Up there. Um, we do actually look at the, it is required, the PCAT is required, and we do look at that. It's not weighted as heavily as your course load or your GPA. Um, it's probably about 10% that we look at, um, but we do look at the PCAT, but we also, we look very closely at the transcripts too. We, we also look at the PCAT, but we wouldn't require that you take the PCAT. Like, if we looked at your application and you had not taken the PCAT yet, we might still offer you an interview and even say that you're conditionally accepted upon successful completion of the PCAT. We don't look at the PCAT at all. Don't even touch that tab on PharmCast. We, we don't use the PCAT, um, but, but it's, it's something that you should continue to be aware of and to um, you know, sort of keep it on your radar. Uh, I think there are, there are I, I know there are some of us schools in California that are um, having some discussions about it. We have always, always, uh, even though we don't require it, we have um, met with PCAT representatives um, every year just to sort of get a sense of the exam. And we, we want to keep our sort of ears to the wall to make sure that we're not missing something that could be valuable for us in the admissions process. And um, PCAT is uh, undergoing uh, some dramatic changes that I think are more reflective of the type of characteristics that we're looking for 
in PharmD students, particularly things like critical thinking skills, um, you know, in addition to sort of the problem solving questions that come up on the PCAT. Um, you, met, you heard all of us talk about communication skills, and so the, you know, the transition of PCAT to address some of those, those skill sets that we're all looking for um, that aren't necessarily uh, provided to us in the PCAT exam. Um, it's safe to probably assume that down the line, I think some schools in California, including UCSF possibly, may be looking to the PCAT exam, if not portions of it that can give us a little bit more information on an applicant. So I wouldn't totally dismiss it. Um, but sort of keep it on your radar, especially if you're you know, a first or a second year undergraduate student, because perhaps by the time you get to the point of applying to a farm school, um, you may be asked to take the PCAT exam. Yeah, at Tour University, we're also in the position where not, we don't require the PCAT for the application, and because we get a mixture of PCAT scores from some applicants and, don't, and some we don't, we tend not to look at it because we don't want to necessarily bias with information that others have not provided us with. So at this point, we're not really taking a look at it. However, with some of the pre projected changes that may be happening with the PCAT examination, it is something that we are thinking about using in the future potentially as a tool. But at the moment, it's not a requirement, and it's not used in our evaluation. So we have a little less than five minutes. Um, we'll try our best to squeeze in one or maybe two more questions. Most of our students who were admitted into this particular class that started a few weeks ago were biology, chemistry, or biochemistry majors. But in that class, we also had, um, there were two music majors, a uh, communications major. Uh, there was an individual with a law degree. I think their undergraduate degree was in philosophy. So um, we don't have a major requirement. And in fact, um, you know, somebody who's a non-science major could be, I mean, that could be the factor that sets them apart from everybody else. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I always encourage individuals to pursue your passion as an undergrad. If you want to go to pharmacy school, then obviously there are prerequisites need to be completed. But, you know, the undergraduate experience, from my opinion, is really about pursuing that which you're passionate about and really interests you. And so, um, you know, celebrate the fact that you may be a major that's not like the rest of your classmates. Um, and we certainly don't have a requirement. And in fact, individuals who are non-science majors who do well in the prerequisites, that may have been more challenging for them uh, as a result of you know, not having that fundamental science background but really wanting to pursue pharmacy as a profession. It's part of the diversity yeah. that yeah, we talk about. You know, just like what kind of experiences, what kind of academic backgrounds do people have? It is kind of interesting. It's, uh, I think, the same, the same sort of uh, thing that we see in our program as well. Most of our applicants um, are coming to us from a biology program, a chemistry program, a biochemistry program. Um, we do get a lot of applicants from other humanities or social sciences, um, and some of them have been quite successful. They're going back and they're getting the prereqs what they need after having you know, some sort of revelation that this might be the right profession for them. And it has been kind of interesting that some of our more inspiring group leaders in the programs have not been scientists initially in their training. And I think that says a lot about passion, that they bring that with them. And so, you know, we've always seen that as something, you know, sometimes it's quite desirable. Um. And the last question. We don't have any humanities requirements. All of our requirements uh, fall in the realm of upper division chemistry and um, biology. Um, and again, we don't have a major requirement, so there's no specific type of, uh, say for example, humanities credits that we're looking for, and we don't actually require any, you know, we, we, it is only necessary to apply to the program that you have a bachelor's degree. So in whatever capacity you obtain that, if you met those requirements, that's good enough for us, plus those basic upper division science courses that are needed. We have had some students complete electives, uh, humanity, social sciences online. That's not a problem for us. And we do like to see those harder upper level science and math courses you know, done in a classroom setting, if at all possible. We, um we don't have a policy. Obviously, we would like to see courses taken you know, in person because it allows you the opportunity to interact with classmates, interact you know, with professors. Um, 
you know, someone's candidacy or application um, competitiveness doesn't come down to one class. Mm -hmm. So I think it's fairly common for someone to have at least, you know, one, perhaps two online classes. Um, there are certain subject areas we obviously won't accept an online class. Um, I've seen many online public speaking classes um, and asked to see the syllabus just because I'm more curious than anything to see how you do an online public speaking class. But, you know, with a humanities class, and uh, we will accept an online class, but I don't, I don't, I don't want to say that because it's less important than the science classes, um, because those humanities classes are, you know, important, uh, you know, because they create a well-rounded person, not just a, you know, sci a science person. Um, but you know, given again, as I mentioned earlier, the landscape of education, sometimes that might be the only option, especially if you're trying to complete a prerequisite that may not have been part of your undergraduate track. I think what you want to watch out for is when you're getting those prereqs, do you, or you're trying to meet a certain kind of prereq, do you need to have, for example, some of those science courses, do you need to have a lab that yeah. goes with that? So if it's coming as a combination sort of requirement, you might want to keep an eye on that when thinking about making online choices. So this concludes our first admissions panel. Thank you all for coming, and let's give our panelists a big round of applause. <laughs>